Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving. I'll be a living sanctuary, Lord, for you. Can we sing that together? Lord, prepare me yeah. to be a sanctuary. Consecrate me now to thy service, Lord, by the power of grace divine. Let my soul look up with a steadfast hope, and Lord, would you allow my will to be lost in thine. I pray for this moment, God, that you would do in this moment what I cannot do. Take these words and turn them into missiles of transformation. So that we leave from this place not only inspired, but transformed to be who you're calling us to be. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's children said together, amen. Well, this is the day the Lord has made. We rejoice and we are glad in it. I'll try it again. This is the day the Lord has made. We rejoice. One more time, I'm going to do it for the balcony. This is the day the Lord has made. We rejoice and we are glad. And if you're excited about being in God's house one more time, come on, why don't you, everybody, join me in giving God hand praise all over the church. Come on, he's worthy of that. That's the least we can do. While you're clapping, will you help me praise God for Dr. Bowie? Come on, help me praise God for Dr. Bowie. Keep those hands clapping. Help me praise God for my big sister in the faith. Pastor Wyvette Blair Lavalet. Help me praise God for her. And keep those hands clapping and turn to the person near you and tell them I'm clapping for you as well. I'm clapping for you as well. What a joy. What a joy. What a joy it is to be. What a joy it is to be in the Lord's house. And let me just rush to say how... Um, Honored, honored and humbled I am to be in this sacred space called Sanctuary with you amazing people who make up the St. Luke Community Church. I am, if I can just be completely transparent, humbled, honored and horrified all at the same time. Let me just tell you that in part because this is my very first time coming to Dallas. And here's the other thing. Uh, I don't know if you guys know this, but you guys are like somebody all over the country. And, uh, and uh, let me just say, um, yeah, I was just all kind of nervous because I didn't know what to expect. But as soon as I came into the place, I just felt like I was at home. And so I just feel like I'm family today. I just feel like I'm family. Word of God reminds us that your gift will make room for you and bring you before great men. And I'm standing today as proof positive that God stays true to his word. I want to pause to just really publicly express my heartfelt gratitude and appreciation to Dr. Bowie for consenting to allow me to come. I realize he didn't have to do it, um, especially now in an age where ministerial ethics is at an all-time low. You take an amazing risk bringing somebody you've never heard before to stand before your people, but pastor, I'm honored that you would be willing to take a risk, and the same is true for you as well, uh, Reverend Y. All right. Uh, why don't you grab your Bibles and journey with me to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter number 12. I am well aware that you guys over the last month have been in a series entitled Why, where you've been questioning uh, certain areas that will challenge our faith. 
And um, typically, it's typical that whenever you, amongst in the preaching circles, whenever you go out, you, you want to bring one of your sticks, right? You want to bring, you want to bring a sermon that you've preached before. Um, but the Lord uh, this week caused me to write something. And so uh, we're going to be on a journey together. Let's see what God has to say. Second Corinthians chapter number 12. The entirety of our text will come from verses 7 through 10. But I just want to highlight for the purposes of preaching verse 8 and 9. They constitute the framework for our sermonic time together. I'm reading from the New International Version, so it reads this way. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. This is the word of God for the people of God. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. For the time that is ours to share together on this Young Adult Weekend, I want to label this text and preach from the subject, When God Says No. When God Says No. The story is told of two young boys who spent the night at their grandparents' house. When it was time for them to go to bed, they did as they did every night. They knelt beside their bed and they began to say their prayers. While they're praying, the youngest one began praying to the top of his lungs. He said, Lord, I pray that you bless me with a new PS4. Bless me, Lord, with a new bike. And oh, yeah, Lord, while you at it, can you bless me with the new J's that just came out? It was new Jordans. Yeah. <laughs> his, his older brother leaned over to him who was next to him and nudged him. And asked him, why are you shouting out your prayers? You do know God is not deaf. He can hear you. To which the younger brother replied, I know God ain't deaf, man. But grandma is. <laughs> <laughs> but I know that if she hears me, she's going to make sure that I get everything that I'm praying for. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the great joys of walking with Christ is this sense of satisfaction and security that comes from knowing that we serve a God who delights in answering our prayers. I can't speak for any of you, but there's a sense of satisfaction that comes from opening up the scriptures and reading in those red letters that if I ask, it will be given. If I seek, I'm going to find. If I knock, the door will be open to me. There's a sense of exhilaration and excitement. It comes from knowing that if I ask anything in Jesus' name according to God's will, that not only will God hear me, but he, but he will do what I'm asking him to do. There's a sense of security, Pastor Lavalle, that comes from recognizing that because what Christ accomplished out on that skull-shaped hill called Calvary, that you and I no longer need a, a pastor, a prophet, a priest, or a preacher to go before us and intercede on our behalf. But because the veil in the temple has been torn in two from top to bottom, you and I have direct access to God. And in the language of our ancestors, because we have the God of the universe on the main line, we can tell him whatever we want. Because we serve a God who delights in answering our prayers. I've discovered, ladies and gentlemen, in the 29 years that I've been alive, that whenever God answers our prayers, it reinforces our confidence. It motivates us to be courageous. It energizes our prayer life. It fortifies our faith and it amplifies our joys. Why? Because we serve a God who delights in answering our prayers. But ladies and gentlemen, I've also discovered that the same God who delights in answering our prayers every now and then becomes the God who will delay in his response or watch this, determine not to respond to our prayers the way we anticipated. If you've walked with God for any length of time, I'm sure you found yourself at least one time in a situation where you felt like you had to yell out your prayers because you were trying to figure out if God was somehow deaf. What happens when you ask and it yields no response? 
How do you respond to life when you seek and it appears that the thing that you are searching for is like a needle in a haystack? What happens when you knock only to feel like there's nobody available on the other side of the door to respond to your knock? What happens, ladies and gentlemen, when you pray a prayer to God and that which you pray for never materializes or manifests? This is where we find our central character, the Apostle Paul, in our text this weekend. When we come to our text in 2 Corinthians chapter number 12, we find that tent maker from Tarsus, the, go the gospel globe trotter, the apostle Paul in a situation that for all intents and purposes could only be remedied by his prayers. The text tells us, Dr. Bowie, that at the height of his ministry, Paul finds himself in a situation where he is left to live with what he calls a thorn in the flesh. And this thorn has taken away his ability to enjoy and experience life at what he believes is the highest level. Now for centuries, scholars have tried to identify what the thorn was was that Paul was referring to. Some say that he was referring to a physical malady like an eye disease or a severe migraines. Others believe that Paul was referring to something a little bit more seriously like a bout with malaria or uh, epilepsy. And even some claim that despite being an incredible writer, Paul thorn was the fact that he had a very distinct speech impediment which made it difficult for him to be clear in his presentation of the Gospels and even others suggest that Paul thorn was a moral issue suggesting that as great of a preacher as Paul was he struggled with a major sin issue they they take his confession from Romans 7 where he declares the things that I want to do I don't do and the stuff that I hate to do that's what I find myself doing because for some sick twisted and trifling reason whenever I want to do good evil shows up the fact of the matter is ladies and gentlemen none of us know for certain what Paul's struggle is and if I can be frank, I'm glad that we don't know. Because it gives us the opportunity this weekend to slide our names and our issue into the text. Because as I scan this sacred space called sanctuary, I realize I'm preaching to a group of people in this room. I realize everybody's not in this place, but there are a remnant of us in the room who are dealing with our own thorns and are experiencing our own seasons of distress and delay and defeat and discouragement, even as we sit in this sanctuary. Now, now, don't get me wrong. I see you smiling. Ladies, I see you with your hair slayed, your edges laid, and your face beat to the gods. I realize that I'm talking to a group of educated people who have more degrees than thermometers and nice salaries. I saw a couple foreign cars when I pulled up this morning. But underneath all of that, I also recognize that there are a remnant of people in this room who knows what it's like to be at a place in life where you have everything that you thought you wanted only to realize that there would still be moments where you had to suffer with bad health and funny money and broken dreams and broken promises and broken expectations and you pray to God and you pray to God and you pray to God and God has not responded and even though you're in church today your body is here but your mind is somewhere else because you're trying to figure out what's the point of praying if God's going to if all God's going to do is turn a deaf ear to my request so what do you do when it seems like your prayers are just bouncing off the ceiling well, Paul gives us a template here. He shows us how you and I ought to respond to life when God does not respond to us the way we anticipate it. So let's, let's jump in. When God says no, I want to encourage you this weekend not to see it as an obstacle, but I want you to see it as an opportunity to, number one, re-examine or re-evaluate your soul's motivation. The text says in verse number seven, that God sends Paul a thorn in the flesh and the only reason God sent the thorn was so that Paul could be prevented from pride. You see in verses 1 through 6 of the text, Paul tells the church at Corinth about how he has just experienced something that very few people had ever experienced. He has just been to heaven and he returned. 
Now let's be real for a moment. After an experience like that, it would not have caught any of us by surprise to find Paul walking around thinking that he was better than everybody else. Because as humans, there's something in our psyche that's always ready to make ourselves seem more important to other, more important than others because of the success and the status that we may receive in life. And so God in his infinite wisdom knew that he had to humble Paul. So he chooses to do something that Paul did not anticipate as a way to remind him that no matter how much you experience and no matter what you experience, no matter what success you garner in life, you are no better than the person who was seated next to you because whatever you are, God made you. And whatever you have, God gave it to you. Warren Wisby put it this way. He said every now and then God has to balance our blessings with our burdens because if he doesn't, you and I will become like spoiled children. And church, I've discovered that's the same. I've discovered rather that the same is true when it comes to our prayer life. Sometimes God chooses not to answer our prayers the way we want them answered because he wants us to be humble. Because let's be real for one quick moment. Imagine with me the type of person you would be if God answered all your prayers the way you wanted them answered. For some of us, for some of us we can't even envision that because we already know if God answered our prayers the way that we, want them, uh, we wanted them to be answered, you would not be able to tell us anything. So sometimes, sometimes God has to say no to our prayers because he knows that an unanswered prayer has a way of humbling us in ways that answered prayers cannot. One of the ways that an unanswered prayer prevents us from becoming conceited is that an unanswered prayer gives us the space to check our motivations for why we are praying for what we're praying for. James tells us in James chapter 4 verse number 3 very plainly that one of the reasons that we don't get our prayers answered is simply because when we pray, we pray with the wrong motives. Which begs the question, St. Luke, why are you praying for what you're praying for? I mean, really, why, why, why do you need a new car? Is it because... Uh, you just trying to floss and flaunt thinking that this car will give you some sense of significance or are you planning to use this car to pick up others who have yet to experience the explosive worship of St. Luke? Why, why, why do you want the house that you want? Is it because you're using that house as a symbol to the world that you've arrived as a black man and as a black woman? Or is it because you see it as a symbol that can be used to invite others over to experience the hospitable kindness of a good and gracious God? Why do you want the promotion, St. Luke? Is it because you sick and tired of having somebody tell you what to do and you just ready to tell somebody else what to do? Or do you see your work as worship and you realize that your job is an opportunity to gain greater influence in the lives of those you work with? Why do you want a husband? Why do you want a wife? Is it so that you can become a kingdom couple? that raises godly offsprings that will stand as kingdom citizens in the next generation? Or is it because you assume that getting married is the cure to curbing your out of control sexual appetite? I guess I'm trying to ask, why are you praying for what you're praying for? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you, if your only motivation for praying and so that you can gain popularity, prestige, power, or position. God says you can stop praying those prayers because I'm not even interested in answering any of those prayers. Why? Because you're praying with improper motives. God says I am not going to answer those kind of prayers because frankly I'm tired of you treating me like I'm some supernatural vending machine where you can push a couple of buttons and out pops your blessing. God says the kind of prayers I'm looking for are prayers that seek my presence and prayers that are motivated by my purpose. God says I'm looking for people who are not ashamed to say you know what this is what I want God but nevertheless not my will but yours 
be done. Because God says, I'm, I'm interested in marrying, watch this, I'm interested in marrying your desires to my destiny for your life, which means that every now and then there will be times where I won't answer your prayers like you expect them because I need you to fully process what you're asking for. Because if you do not process what you're asking for and I give you what you ask for, it may do more damage than you could ever know. I guess really what I'm trying to say here, the whole point and principle of this first point is this. You can tweet this one at the real VLC too. You can tweet this one. Sometimes God will not answer our prayers because he wants us to check ourselves before we wreck ourselves. And so when God says no, reevaluate your soul's motivation. Here's the second one. When God says no, Respect God's sovereign position. In other words, you and I, when we come to God in prayer, we have to embrace the reality that God has the right to respond to our prayers however he wants to. Which sometimes will include him saying no. Paul says in verse 8 that he went to God and I, he said, I pleaded with God three times to remove the thorn. Now, now Paul realized that if anything was ever going to be done to fix his problem, that he had to go to God in prayer. But notice, when he prays, he does not pray one of those short, sweet, now I lay me down to sleep kind of prayers. Paul realized that if this situation was ever going to be fixed, that he would have to labor, or in the language of our ancestors, we would have to tarry in prayer. Paul says, stuff got so bad for me, Vicente, that the only thing I could do was scream and beg and plead for God to take the thorn away from me. And the reason I did it was because in my mind, I'm saying to myself, Lord, I can serve you better if I didn't have this problem. But Paul said, V, no matter how loud I got, no matter how many times I cried out, no matter how passionate or eloquent or creative I prayed my prayers, God chose not to answer the prayer the way I wanted it answered. Which causes the question here to be asked, St. Uh, Luke, what do you do when you find yourself in a place where you are overwhelmed by life's limitations and you go to God like you've been taught and God still overrules your request? If I can be honest, Dr. Boo, that's a tough place to be in. Because for some of us, we're thinking to ourselves, Lord, we, we've done our part. We did what you told us to do. We've come to you. And, 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 and we put our whole heart on the altar. All we're asking you to do, Lord, is remove this challenge, remove this limitation from our lives so that we can serve you better. But Paul teaches us here, but, but Paul teaches us something here. He shows us that in those moments, sometimes the best thing you and I can do is respect the fact that God has the right to overrule your request. It's getting real quiet now. And I understand why. That too. And perhaps the thing that you're thinking about is something that maybe you've never considered before. And, and that's this. For many of us, we fail to recognize that the God that we serve is sovereign. Which means that God can do what he wants to do, when he wants to do it, how he wants to do it. And watch this, to whom he wants to do it to. Can I tell you today, just because you pray a prayer to God doesn't necessarily mean that God's going to give you that which you ask for. Yes, it is indeed true that God desires to say yes to us in prayer. In fact, that's the reason why Jesus died on the cross, so that God could say yes to our prayers. But because he is God, he reserves the right to tell us no. But ladies and gentlemen, I've got some good news amidst, amidst the bad news. Because I've grown to a point in life, Pastor Lavalle, where I don't even trip as much over the times when God tells me no. Because I've been walking with God 22 years. And in the 22 years I've been walking with God, I've walked with him long enough to realize that whenever he says no to whatever I'm asking, it typically means he has a bigger, better yes in mind. 
Yeah, whenever, whenever God tells me no, it means he's about to do something that I never anticipated because God's no is not an answer of rejection. God's no is an answer of redirection. Good God Almighty. We, we, we see a crystal clear example of this. We see a crystal clear example of this through the story of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. You, you, you remember Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, don't you? The Bible tells us in John chapter 11 that Lazarus, one of Jesus' closest homeboys, gets real sick. And the Bible says that his sisters get a little anxious about the sickness of their brother because he's at the point of death in their minds. And they go to Jesus, and in the language of today's current vernacular, they slide in Jesus' DM, and they tell him that his homeboy, his brother, is sick. The Bible tells us that Jesus gets the message, but in his sovereignty, he chooses to stay where he is two more days. By the time Jesus gets to Mary and Martha, it's been four days and Lazarus is dead. Mary and Martha, when Jesus gets there, they, come, they had to be sisters because the first thing they did was come to Jesus with an attitude because uh, they, the, they said to Jesus, they said to Jesus, now, Lord, if you would have responded like I needed you to respond, we wouldn't even be in this situation in the first place. But I, I love, I love, I love Pastor Parker how Jesus responds. He doesn't get upset. He doesn't cop an attitude back. Dr. Boy, he doesn't even justify his actions. All he said was show me where you laid him. And the Bible says that Jesus goes to the tomb, prays a prayer to the Father, and very, uh, in, in a very uh, unique way, just very simply says, Lazarus, come out. And the Bible says that the man who was dead for days comes walking out of the grave. I messed that up so you missed what I just said. Jesus says, show me where you laid him. And the Bible says Jesus goes to the tomb, prays a prayer to God, and very simply says, Lazarus, come out. And the Bible says that the man who was dead four days came walking out of the grave. Come here, you missed what I just, you missed what I just said. So, so, so let me help you, let me help you. The reason that Mary and Martha was upset with Jesus was because in their mind, the only thing Jesus could do through their lives was heal Lazarus. But Jesus chose to say no to what they wanted because he wanted to, them to experience something that eyes had never seen and ears had never heard and their hearts may not have ever been able to conceive had Jesus not did what he wanted to do. He said no to Lazarus' healing so that he could say yes to Lazarus' resurrection. Yep. And I don't know who I'm preaching to, but I, I, I feel like I feel like I've got two or three people in the room who can help me, uh, help me give God praise for the things that God chose to say no to. I got a funny feeling and a sneaking suspicion that I'm not the only one in here who can celebrate the fact that I thank God for the stuff that God said no to. There's somebody in the room who can testify, thank God that you didn't let me get that job because they're on the verge of being bankrupt. Some brother in the room can testify thank God you didn't let me marry that girl because I seen her at the mall last week and she looked like five miles of bad road some sister in here can testify you know what that breakup broke my heart but I thank God you didn't let me marry that trifling joker because I seen him on Instagram and they got three kids by three different baby mamas and he ain't committed to none of them I know it may be a little weird I know it may be a little weird, St. Luke, but every now and then, you just ought to stop and give God praise for the stuff that didn't work in your life. Yeah. Because I recognize, hallelujah, I recognize that when God said no to that, he was not rejecting me. He was redirecting me to the spaces and places that he already had prepared for me. Now, one to him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that you can ask or think according to the power that's at work in you. Do, do me a favor, give somebody a high five and tell them thank God he does what's best. Thank, thank God, thank God he does what's best. 
Sound man, if you can put a little bit more on the monitors, that would be most amazing. Let me move. When God says no, reevaluate your motives, respect God's sovereign position. Here's the next thing. When God says no, remember God's sufficient grace. Text says that after not responding the way that Paul anticipated in verse 8, God eventually responds by saying to Paul in no uncertain terms, Paul, I'm not going to remove the problem like you're asking me to do, but don't trip. You still going to have a problem, but I'm going to also give you a solution. <laughs> Dr. Bowie, what I love about God here is when God finally responds, notice that he doesn't give Paul any explanation. He does not explain to Paul why he gave him a thorn in the flesh. He, he doesn't explain to Paul how long he's going to live with the thorn in the flesh. He doesn't give Paul any explanations. All he, did, all he did in the text was give him a promise. Now I'm pretty sure that while Paul was praying, Paul would have appreciated the detailed explanation from God about what he was going through. But instead of giving Paul the explanation that he wanted, God understood that in this situation, the only thing that was needed was a promise. Only reason why I'm taking this scenic route here is because there's somebody in the room who's been looking for God to explain everything in detail before you choose to trust him. I, I, I'll give you one example. It's an easy illustration here. You, you, you want to trust God with giving God 10%, but you're looking for God to give you a detailed, itemized explanation for where the other 90 is going to come from. But what Paul teaches us here is that there will be times when God will not give us any detailed maps of where we're going. But that's okay, because I've got two or three witnesses in the room, I'm sure, who can testify as long as you got the promise, you got everything you need. Because as believers, we don't, need ex we don't live by explanations. We stand on God's promises. We don't, we don't walk by what we see. No, you don't walk by what you see. You walk by what he said. Come, come here, Abram. The Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 12 that God comes to a gentleman by the name of Abram who has just lost his father and has assumed patriarchal responsibility of the family. And God comes to Abram and tells him to leave his family, leave his friends, and leave everything that was familiar to him him and go to a land that the Lord would show him but notice really quickly God never gave Abram a map or God never told him the final destination God never says in the text leave your family and go to Canaan no he says leave your family and go to a land that I'm going to show you all God gave Abram was the promise that if Abram did what God told him to do that God would bless him and make him into a great nation all God gave Abram was the promise that if Abram did what God told him to do that God would make his name great and he would bless those who bless him and curse those who curse him because as long as you got the promise you got everything you need text says and when Paul prays, God did not change the situation by removing the affliction. Instead, God chose to remedy Paul's problem by adding a needed and necessary ingredient to the situation, which was the promise of his grace. Got a question here. What is grace? It's God's unmerited favor. It's his unconditional love. It's his, in the language of my pastor back home in Austin, it's his willingness to give good gifts to bad children. God says to Paul, I'm not going to remove the problem, but I am willing to extend to you an extra measure, watch this, of something you don't even deserve. But if you accept and embrace the gift of grace, Paul, you'll be able to turn whatever seems like tragedy into triumph. Why? Because my grace is sufficient. Lord tells Paul, I may not give you the healing you want, but I am more than willing to give you the grace that you need. And I came to tell somebody that in spite of the difficulty that you may be facing in life today, God has given gifted you with everything that you need to not only face but beat whatever's facing you 
Not sure who I'm preaching to here. I came to tell somebody in this sacred space called sanctuary that the next time you take inventory of your life, I want to encourage you not to measure how good God's been to you by another house or another car or another job or another boo or new friends. But I want to encourage you, St. Luke, to base your life on the fact that you have been extended an opportunity to be in relationship with the God of the universe who is standing ready to give you the grace you need. Because my big mama, if she was holding the mic, Dr. Bowie, would say it was grace that woke me up this morning. It was grace that kept me in my right mind. It was grace that gave me a reasonable portion of my health and strength. It was grace that opened doors that were shut in my face. It was grace that restored the joy in my soul and it was grace that saved my soul. Is there anybody here who don't mind giving God praise and testifying I don't know where I would be had it not been for the grace of God. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. I'm pushing toward the close. God tells Paul, I'm not going to give you what you want. But you can take to the bank that I'm going to always make sure you have the grace that you need. So when God says no, you trekking with me. When God says no, reevaluate your motives. Respect God's position as the sovereign one. Remember God's sufficient grace and fourthly and finally rely on God's supernatural power. Rely on God's supernatural power. By the time we get to verse 10, Paul has moved. There's been a shift in his soul. He's moved from praying that God will remove the problem to being able to take pleasure in the problem. Now, how did he make that transition? Listen to what he says in verse 10. He says, that is why for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, and in difficulty. He was able to make this shift in his soul because Paul understood that everything he was going through was for the cause of Christ. And to know Paul, is to know that he was willing to do whatever was necessary to improve the fame of Jesus' name in the world. Now, I really could sit down because that's really the whole sermon right there. But I'm left to deal with some tension here. Because when I look at verse 9, Pastor Lavalle, Paul makes this paradoxical statement. I'm sorry, end of verse 10. He closes the text. By, this, by adding this paradoxical statement, verse 10, he says, For when I am weak, then I'm strong. Now, I got to be honest. I'm confused by Paul's language here because the last time I checked, weakness is the complete antithesis of strength. So, so I had to ask the Lord because I'm trying to figure out how can I be weak and strong at the same time? And then the Lord said to me, Look at it again. And it hit me because what Paul helps me to understand in the text is that whenever God says no to our prayers, it's an opportunity for us to realize that God can do more with his power than we can in our own. This is why he says in verse 9, my power is made perfect in weakness. Pastor Odom, that great preacher prognosticator, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, put it this way. God's power can only be magnified in the poverty of believers. In, in other words, God's power can never really be fully accessed until you and I accept the fact that we are weak. And I can... See, it's the consternation on your face for a few of you because for many of us, we have a tendency to see weakness as a liability. <laughs> Which explains why many of us go through life acting like we ain't got no weaknesses. Because in our minds, a weakness is a problematic. It's a liability. But what Paul helps us here to see very clearly is that 
our areas of weakness are not problematic. Watch this. They are very simply a platform for God to demonstrate his perfect power in our experience. And church, it is not until you and I trust God enough to admit that we are weak that God would even attempt to allow his sufficient and powerful grace to overshadow our lives. And church, I thank God for that. Because the fact that I have weaknesses liberates me from trying to act like I got everything all together. Paul helps me here to stop walking around like I got life all figured out at 29 because when I'm weak, it's a platform for God to demonstrate his strength in our experiences because in my weakness I not only get God's unmerited favor but another definition for grace is God's unlimited power so the next time church you find yourself overwhelmed helpless and at a point where you feel absolutely hopeless I want to encourage you to see that moment as an invitation from God to access his supernatural powerful grace because God says it's in the very thing that you are not good at it's in the mistake that you've made it's in the problem that you have it's in your frailty it's in your struggles that I can give you the power and the grace to be strong I close here but before I go let me remind you and when adversity and challenges come your way and let me just remind you they will come your way when they come you and I have a choice to make we can choose to react to the problem like a turkey or we can respond to the problem like an eagle you see turkeys try to react to the storms in their own strength and in their own power this is why for many of them when storms become too much for them their immediate re reaction is to go running underneath the barn because they praying and hoping that the storm won't come their way they trying to take shelter but an eagle on the other hand responds differently you see when an eagle sees a storm coming because he knows he has something inside of him that gives him the ability to stand the storm here's what he does he takes the courage to leave his shelter he opens up his wings and begins riding in the direction of the storm because he recognizes that the storm is just going to give him what he needs to fly higher than it would if he was flying in his own strength and church I can't speak for none of y'all but I thank God this week that he put something in me that can stand the storms of life I thank God church that in my weakness God demonstrates his supernatural power in my experience and what I love about the power of Dr. Bowie is that it's the same power that unrolled, unrolled rather the blueprint of the earth's foundation of the world and ended up creating cosmos out of chaos simply by saying let there be it's the same power that delivered the children of Israel out of Egypt led them across red seas sustained them in the wilderness and opened the door to their promise it's the same power that God at the stone that killed that giant called Goliath it's the same power that closed the mouth of David's lion it's the same power that regulated the temperature in the Hebrew boys' fire it's the same power I feel real Baptist I know I'm in a United Methodist church but I feel my Baptist jumping on me real quick it's, it's the same power that healed the sick and raised the dead and unstopped deaf ears and fed 5,000 it's the same power that was dead on a Friday but got up bright early on a Sunday morning and the reason I give God praise today that is is because that's the same power that in my moments of weakness will give me strength and sustain me and support me in my seasons of weakness I know you sitting next to somebody do me a favor grab somebody by the hand and tell them you're stronger than you think you are I know you feel weak right now I know you feel overwhelmed right now I know you may be broken right now but I came to encourage you to remind you that you're stronger than you think you are because you got the power of God living on the inside of you and the last time I 
checked. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is God. He's the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary and his understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak and to him who have no might. He increases their strength. Even youth will grow weary and young men will stumble and fall. But they that wait upon the Lord, he shall renew. He shall renew their strength. Their mount up. They'll mount up. Come on, let's ride. They'll mount up on wings like eagles. Not like no turkey. They'll mount up on wings like eagles. They'll run and not be weary. And they'll walk and not faint. So thank you, Father, for your power. For it has resurrected me over painful circumstances that my poor soul would not flee. Is there anybody here who can help me celebrate the fact that you serve a God who's ready to give you the power? Oh, hell, the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall, bring forth the royal diadem and crown him crowd him Lord of all is there anybody here that's gonna help me crown him come on lift a hand open a mouth and give him praise say yeah say yeah say yeah Don't wait till the battle is over. Shout now. You may not feel like you got the power, but I guarantee you I got the power. Can I pray, Pastor? I don't know who I'm, I don't know who I came to preach to. It was my very first time in Dallas, very first time in the St. Luke Church. But if you're at a point where you felt like at some point God was talking to you, just lift your hand. I just want to pray for you. I want to pray for you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You are the source of my strength. <laughs> you are the strength of my life. And so in response, I may not even have my strip yet. I lift, hallelujah, my hands in total praise to, let's keep that. Let's keep that. I knew I was coming to Dr. Boo and I knew I had to do my homework. And I purposely left out talking about verse 9 until the very end. Because as I was doing my study on verse 9, I read it in its original Greek language and it spoke to me in a unique way. Your Bible, verse 9, may say, my grace is sufficient for you. Pastor Carl Lavallee, in the original translation, here's what God actually says. He says, sufficient for you is the grace of me. He says, sufficient for you. In, in, in other words, what God was saying to Paul is, all the grace that you will ever need is found in me.
And I love that because what that shows me, Pastor Odom, is God's not out on the fringes of life dispensing out his grace like some pharmacist at, at Walgreens. No, when things get tough, when things become difficult, when, it's mo when I'm in moments where I'm struggling to pray, I realize that in my seasons of suffering, I got the grace already in me. Watch this. Because he's the grace. <laughs> he's the strength. And so, Father, we thank you for giving us what we need when we need it most. Thank you for strength to push past our fear, strength to push past our insecurities, strength to push past our past mistakes. Thank you for strength to look death in the face. And even if, if somebody's in this room that's experienced death, experiencing facing death in the moment, thank you for strength that recognizes that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And even in those moments, I, I thank you for strength. And I pray, Father, for somebody in this room to trust you that you're already dispensing out the, the grace that they need. I want to thank you, lastly, for the fact that you don't always answer our prayers the way we anticipate it. Because in it, you're giving us an opportunity to get our hearts right, to receive whatever you're going to give us. And usually, whenever you say no, usually means you have a bigger yes in mind and so we stand on the tiptoes of anticipation and we don't wait until you give it to us or until we recognize we have it we praise you for it now in advance in Christ Jesus' name we pray and all of God's children said together amen your hands in the presence of God it's when we are weak God's strength is on us the Lord has spoken the Lord has spoken and today I declare that our church would never be the same the Lord has spoken to our very souls praise God for that prayer that wasn't answered because even our no is a greater yes for God my Lord I didn't realize how much I needed that word if you're glad you got that word give God some praise my Lord maybe a church home and you said pastor I I felt like giving up but today I'm ready to turn it over to the Lord and, and you probably remember St. Luke but but I want to invite you to come real fast to this altar because God read your email I see tears flowing and if you know God read your email come to this altar real fast real fast we want to pray for you and get you out of here so come on come on come on the Lord spoke to you Lord Jesus, this was, I tell you, God says today is your day. God spoke to you. This is your day. My Lord, remember God's sovereignty. Lord Jesus. 
the Lord spoke today and he's still speaking and I thank God for this young brother give God some praise for this word this is your day as he was preaching I could see chains falling off of you as he was preaching I saw your life get better as God was speaking through him, I saw God turning some stuff around in your life. If you know God is shifting some stuff right now, give God some praise in this house. My God. My God. When you leave this place, make sure you get that CD. Because God wants to remind you over and over why that prayer wasn't answered. So God, I thank you today young brother God your hand is on just give God some praise right now I tell you I know good preachers God I thank you right now for pouring out your spirit on Vicente Coatney Jr. God he's blessed this house God poured back in him to bless us again in the next worship celebration so God, we thank you God, that, that lives have been transformed, minds have been regulated because of your preached word. So God, now fill him up. God, as we fill him up, Lord, let us receive the Shekinah glory that's been in this house. So Holy Spirit, have your way. Those who came to this altar, Lord, let them know that because what's been poured out, it shall not get poured out in vain. So we receive it and we walk by faith and not by sight knowing God if you said it we believe it and that settled it so God we thank you for the prayers that weren't answered we thank you for the no's for there were yeses in disguise Lord we thank you right now for even in our weakness your strength is made perfect so Lord we are a weak church and when we confess we are a weak church then we will be a strong church thank you for St. Luke thank you for this moment God that you are doing a new thing thank you that the old has passed away and all things are new because of what you're doing right now have your way God move in this place and at the end of the day we're going to give you praise on and glory it's Jesus who we're going to praise so everybody give God some praise in this house hallelujah 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 Oh, God just shifted some stuff. This church, you've, you've, you, you've been around some preachers, but you heard 29 years old, I know good preaching. No, no, seriously, 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 seriously. We don't bring no TV dinners up in here. Boy, you gave us a five course a la carte with a whole bunch of dessert. Lord Jesus. I'm scared to see what's going to happen at 11 o'clock. And some of y'all probably want to hang around and say, Lord, what are you going to do at 11? You can, you can hang around. Lord Jesus, boy. I feel like Obama just dropping this mic. This mic cost though, die. So so I, I so 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 we had honorarium for you. We're gonna have to keep it to fix up the sheetrock and stuff, die. Acolytes, come on up. Lord Jesus. So I want you to send us out of here on a, with a blessing. Uh, remember we have an our send out for Pastor Owen Reverend Wise. Show some love to our pastors who are going to bless. So I, I know y'all going to want to talk. I'm, I'm telling to give y'all about. Uh, so Pastor Carl, you be on his left. You be on his right. I know y'all want to just say thank you, so I'm going to give you about three minutes. 
because we got to replenish this brother because he got some more at 11, all right? All right, bless him. Look at me. Uh, God bless you and keep you. God make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. I pray that the Lord will lift the light of his countenance around each of you. And I pray into each and every one of your lives that you would experience the incredible, phenomenal strength of God this week when you go out and when you come in, when you lay down, when you get up, in your labor, in your leisure, in your laughter and your tears. And I pray that you would increasingly reach for that strength every day of your life until you see God face to face and you hear him say with your own ears, servant, well done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.